Dr. Scott Parkinson is known to probably almost everyone in this room, but if he's not known to you, he um, is a member of Oxford Presbyterian Church. He's a professor of history at Ball State University um, and teaches there um, throughout the academic year. Um, he is a PhD graduate, student and graduate of Miami. And Dr. Phil Schreier, Philip Schreier, was your PhD advisor. One of them. One of them. And um, as a graduate student, Scott lived in Ox College uh, for some time as well. So um, Scott has an abiding love of history and is a good storyteller to bring history alive. And so we asked Scott to share uh, this week and next week uh, here about um, how change gave birth to the Presbyterian Church. Scott's going to take us on a walk through history. We're going to cover a lot of years, a lot of decades and centuries in the next few moments. Um, um, but this, I just love that we're back in this place where we're continuing to learn. The seminary is built as a place of learning, and that's what we're doing again in this journey. So um, uh, just help me give a big welcome and thanks to Scott for his time today. As this week we hear about how uh, change uh, gave birth to the Presbyterian Church, and next week, how the Church of Scotland became the Presbyterian Church. So this week and next week, uh, we look forward to hearing from Scott. Um, feel free to help yourself to, uh, to refreshments. Um, we'll be breaking for questions, I think, maybe halfway through-ish, and then again at the end. At that time, it would be great to get up and help yourself to more of the, the Danish uh, that, uh, that is provided, as well as to take a look at the books on the table. Um, the books are, are for, your, for your learning. Um, this one in particular, a gift from Kathy Hardy. Kathy gives away Catherine Mary. Uh, <laughs> we're just talking about real names today. Uh, this book was written by a childhood friend of Kathy's, uh, who grew up uh, with Kathy in Scotland and became a professor of Doctor of History as well, uh, Rosalind Marshall uh, on John Knox. This is an opportunity for us to learn more and to tie so many of the stories. Uh, that have been part of our lives, tie them together now. And Scott, thank you for helping us. <coughs> so we turn our attention to what you have for us. Thanks again. All right, as Pastor Lawrence mentioned, I am Scott Parkinson. If you don't know me very well, Nancy, my wife, wrote a clip. Wave your hand. <laughs> We've been members at OPC for about basically almost three full years. We started coming in the fall of 2016 and joined up in the early part of 2017. So the question is, and Pastor Lawrence kind of talked a little about this, how did I end up speaking to you today? Back in the summer, Pastor Lawrence asked me, could I do something along these lines? And I said, yeah, I think I could probably do something. Yeah. But I'm no expert on Scottish history. I'll make that disclaimer right now. I'm not even an expert on religious history. I do teach early American history and world history at Ball State. And in the world history class, I do cover topics that will kind of come in and out of the story here a little bit later on. So I thought, well, oh, okay, I can bring some of the stuff from the class lectures and bring that in. Um, yes, Pastor Lawrence was correct. Dr. Schreiber was on my dissertation committee. He's one of my advisors, and so is Dr. Baird, who's seated with us this morning. So, so what are you going to learn from today? Three big theme type questions. How change uh, gave birth to the Church of Scotland. Now what change am I talking about? Any guesses on this? The answer is on the slide. The Reformation. The Reformation. Very good. The Reformation. So that's number two. The Presbyterian place in the Reformation. And then number three, and I'm still kind of struggling with this a little bit. The unique and inherent qualities of today uh, that filled with such potential to impact peoples and lands far beyond Scotland. Uh, Pastor Lawrence and I met down here on Friday morning at 10 o'clock to kind of make sure all of this was going to work technology-wise, and we looked at this slide and he said, do you have any more questions? I said, yeah, I'm still struggling with that number three there. So I brought those questions in from uh, an email that Pastor Lawrence had sent me about what he kind of wanted to cover in this. But he also said, I'm kind of liberal to you know, do what I need to do to talk about this. Towards the end of the presentation, 
um, I'll include some slides that kind of show you the highlights of the trip that some of you will be taking to Scotland. If you've not been there before, you'll get a little taste of what you're going to see. I did throw those in there. I thought, well, if you're coming to this and you want to learn a little bit, it's not just going to be about John Knox, okay? Although he's an interesting character. I found out some information the other day about him. So, what changed? Let's look at the Church of Scotland. This is kind of the focus here as part of this presentation. There's the basic, the basic definition. You can see the Scottish name pronounced pronunciation. Uh, the Scots Kirk. You've heard that name, the Kirk, a lot. It's the National Church of Scotland uh, today. It's Presbyterian in nature. It adheres to the Bible and Westminster Confession. The Church of Scotland celebrates two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This comes really from John Calvin. John Calvin was a big believer in baptism and the Lord's Supper. And there's some other rites that they do adhere to, such as confirmation and matrimony. It is a member of the World Communion of Reformed Churches today. It traces its roots back to Christianity in Scotland. And we'll talk just a little bit about where that begins. But its identity is principally shaped by the Reformation of 1560. This is the Reformation in Scotland in 1560. Now, the Reformation begins in 1517 with Martin Luther, and then it catches fire in Europe. It jumps the channel. Um, it's eventually in England. We'll talk about that briefly, and then works its way northward to Scotland. It's not the only religion that you find in Scotland today. I found this slide, this information online. 2001 to 2011 is a 10-year period here. See the numbers. I don't know if you can see the clicker very well, the little red dot. Um, 2 million, 146, now in 2011, 177. Um, so there is a, a slide of 10% in those 10 years. But you also see in some other uh, face, uh, particularly other Christian groups, there's a slide. Uh, there is a profound uh, increase in Islam, profound increase in Hinduism, Buddhism. Uh, in Scotland. Don't get the bottom, uh, a big drop in other religion, and then no religion, reporting no religion, that were up to almost 2 million in 2011. Uh, some that even state uh, of affiliation with the religion. So I found that kind of interesting. And then I found this information. This is from the actual Church of Scotland, their information. Now, those numbers don't jive up with those numbers, and I'm still trying to figure out why that's not jiving up. But I did find these numbers. In 2013 to 2018, the actual membership, and then versus the population. You can see the numbers are sliding down. Quite a bit, actually. I did some calculation, and I read online, it said that it's below 400,000 today, as far as members. It's doubtful that actually more than 100,000 attend church every Sunday in the Church of Scotland. And that basically means that about 1% of Scotland's total population is going to the Church of Scotland and is a member on any given Sunday. Now, that's probably a problem as we will walk in churches. We have that situation in the United States today. Everybody hear me okay? As soon as I left Friday from talking with Pastor Lawrence, my throat starts getting scratchy and I felt like I had a cold coming on. I'm like, oh, no, that's just what I mean. We couldn't get the microphones to work, sorry. So going without the microphones, I'm just predicting. So I don't know the I did some calculation. The church, it said, the, Scot the Church of Scotland on the website said, it's continuing to lose approximately 20,000 members each year. Now, I did a calculation based on that 325, 695 for 2018. If they continue to lose 20,000 every year, in 16 years, they'll have a suit as far as the church base. So I'm sure they're trying to figure out a way to attract people um, to the Church of Scotland. But where does it begin? I found these maps, and I find these helpful a little bit. It deals with the Roman occupation of Northern Britain. Now, maybe it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on, but you can see the arrows indicate and the years are indicated here. This would be 79 AD or 79 CE, common era. You can see the various peoples that are making up 
some of those areas as the Normans moved up into this region. And then, of course, they occupy and build forts and castles, kind of solidify their presence in northern Britain and what is today southern Scotland. We believe, of course, that the Romans kind of introduced Christianity to those living in northern Britain and southern Scotland. But that's not really where uh, the Church of Scotland can trace its roots back to. It. We'll talk about uh, that in just a second. But we introduce the Romans because they're there early on. They build two walls to kind of protect their northern flanks, the northern flanks of their kingdom in Britain. Hadrian's Wall, we'll see some pictures of that in a minute, sorry. And then the Anconan Wall to the north, uh, reaching across this little neck of land. Uh, Edinburgh is about right here, correct? And Stirling is up in here. So you're going to see Stirling and Edinburgh. Uh, this is kind of southern. Northern Britain, basically, for the most part. You're not going to be down there, but just kind of show you what's going on. That moves us forward in 208 to 11. There's a better map that kind of shows the two walls 122 AD and 122 AD, a 20 year difference there in the two walls. You can see what's going on in, in basically Roman Britain. Uh, London Ninium uh, is the Roman name for London. See the roads that they built. The Romans are really, of course, in connecting their empires with roads. And so they're up here. They're up in this region early on. What's left of Hadrian's Wall? There are places where you can see the actual remnants of the wall. You can see some people walking back there, and you can say, oh, you know, it's about five feet um, tall. It's not very tall, it doesn't look like it's going to keep too much out. But of course, uh, it was much taller. It's just kind of a 3D representation of one of the block towers that have been along the wall to kind of garrison Roman troops to protect the northern boundaries. And then the Anconan Wall, this is where it was stretched through the highlands there. This map is dated 410. Kind of important. 410 is the point in which Rome abandons uh, Britain for the most part. They, they just they pack up and leave and they're done uh, in Britain. The Roman Empire at that point in time is shrinking anyway. Uh, Rome was sacked uh, in the midpoint of the 400s, uh, a couple different times. The Visigoths, uh, the Ostrogoths moved in, sacked Rome. 476 is the official end of the Roman uh, Empire. And that's the end of what we call medieval history as well. We know that the Romans adopted Christianity during the reign of Theodosius the Great. It was Constantine that kind of directed that it was 313 that Constantine said uh, we're going to embrace Christianity. It's going to be tolerated within the Roman Empire, but he didn't go as far as saying we're going to officially make it the official religion. So that was Theodosius the Great, and that comes in like three, seven, five, something like that. So you may say, well, if we're going back here, we're looking at these maps, 208 to 11, how is it that the Romans are introducing Christianity to those that eventually end up in Scotland if they don't officially embrace it themselves until like, you know, 375 in a CE or AD? But they were already embracing Christianity, so they're bringing that with them to that particular area. But Christianity was introduced to those living in Scotland, brought over from Ireland by Christian missionaries. And St. Columba is not the only one. He's one of several. There was on my notes here, St. Ninian, uh, an individual known as St. Mungo, and then St. Columba. They were coming over probably in the 5th century CE or AD, in the 400s, so that's the time that Rome is leaving. These missionaries are coming over from, from Ireland and bringing Christianity to Scottish shores. Uh, the stained glass window is in the Iona Abbey. You're going to see the Iona Abbey. There's St. Columba. 
Say Kalona first came to the uh, Kid Kyer, I guess that's how you pronounce it. I don't always do well with four names. Huh? Okay. The Kid Kyer Peninsula, and it kind of lands right in here. But this is Ireland right here. Here's London here. Uh, so he was kind of close enough to Ireland, he could still see Ireland across the sea. And he said, I'm just too close to home. And he said, I'm going to pack up and I'm going to move up here. So he goes up here to Ireland, and it's kind of hard to see, but it's way out here on this little tip of land on this peninsula here. And you're going to stay at Ovid uh, as you head out to Ireland. So you're going to be right here and you're going to travel out and cross the waterway, travel out, cross the waterway again to the island of Ireland. And so he moves on up, so he's a little farther away from Ireland, and that's where um, he establishes this uh, monastery or abbey uh, at Iona. So that's what it looks like today. There's some more pictures coming up here. You can see the prominent Celtic cross uh, here. There's one here as well. The cross is standing on the side there. In this picture, these pictures here, <coughs> on, it looks like the tower structure. There's repairs and there's some scaffolding that's up there. But you will see that. I think you'll see that on, I forget what day, day two, day three, day four. I forget. I wrote it down. Day three. You're going to see that on day three of your trip. Some more close up views of the Abbey there in Iona. So St. Columbo, or St. Columba, Columba, was an Irish abbot, missionary, evangelist. Uh, he's credited with spreading Christianity in what is today's Scotland. He founded this, this abbey on Iona. Kind of becomes the dominant religious and political institution in the region for centuries. This kind of dominance. Uh, the year is about 563 is the date. So this is established in 563 is when he comes to Scotland from Ireland with 12 companions. They first landed, as I said, in the entire peninsula and then moves up to Iona. Huh? Yes? <clears throat> you talk about people bringing Christianity, uh, but do you know what flavor of Christianity they were bringing? They're bringing Roman Catholicism from Ireland. Because at this point in time, there's only one church in the world, and that is the Roman Catholic Church. So. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. This is the medieval period, uh, the archbishops, bishoprics, and the bishoprics that are established. There are two archbishoprics, Glasgow and St. Andrews, and then you can see here's one in Iona, Galloway, Argyle, and on up through Scotland. Now this is in the medieval period of time uh, that these developed. Now, after the Normans, and I don't have pictures of the Norman conquest, but the Normans conquered England in 1066. William the Conqueror comes across from Normandy, conquers England, and of course then absorbs uh, the English ways. The Normans and the English kind of merge um, what's going on with them at this point. So this, we're now we're moved up to 1066. But what you see on the slide is Alexander III. The statue um, here of Alexander III is in Saint, or is in Edinburgh at Saint Giles Cathedral. He ruled Scotland uh, in this period of time, about 1280s, and he died in 1286 from a fall from his horse. And when he died, the throne passed to his granddaughter Margaret, who was the maid of Norway. She was being brought over from Norway to assume the throne of Scotland at this point. She fell ill. She died on the island of Orkney before she even got to Scotland. That was 1290. Now, why is all this important? Well, the Scottish people don't have a leader. But the king of England, now in 1290 is Edward I, or known as Edward Longchamps, because of his large uh, height, he's about 6'2", from what I read. He's also referred to as the Hammer of the Scots. This is the point where we bring in William Wallace and the other Scottish 
fighters for independence. So Scotland is on the verge of civil war. Edward realized that. He was invited, actually, by the Scottish nobility to kind of arbitrate the dispute. And before that could begin, he insisted that all the contenders recognize him as Lord Paramount of Scotland. In other words, I'll arbitrate the decision, but she may be the Lord Paramount of Scotland before we do that. So 1292 is when we're talking here. Edward I decides he's going to kind of take over the reins here because the Scottish throne is vacant. Margaret is, is gone, and Edward or Alexander is gone. So what he does is, and of course you might recognize that fellow from uh, the movie Braveheart. This is the actor that plays, plays Edward in that movie. There's a great book uh, about that situation, being Edward in Britain. He decides he's going to invade Scotland. And he up. You can see there's a couple different routes here. 1296, 1298, and then 1303, 1304. Edward takes these armies into Scottish territory. Invading Scotland. And it's at that point in time that the Stone of Destiny is taken from Scotland. It's been, it's been an ancient symbol in the Scottish monarchy for decades, for centuries. It has always been used for the inauguration of Scottish kings like Alexander. It's seen as a sacred object. We don't really know a lot about where it comes from. We know it's there. We know it's there when Edward gets there, and Edward decides he's going to take it. He's going to take it all the way back to London to Westminster Abbey. And in 1296, he does that. He takes it back to Westminster Abbey. He places it under the throne of the monarchs in Westminster Abbey. It remains there, a point of contention for decades, for centuries. Christmas Day, 1950, it disappeared. The theory is that four Scottish students studying in London decide to take the stone from Westminster Abbey. And for three months, no one knew where it was. It shows up 500 miles away. <laughs> it was taken back to Westminster Abbey. And in 1996, finally, it was returned to Scotland. It's not to leave Scotland again until there's a new monarch of the king or the throne of England. So whether it be Charles, whether it be what, William is the next king, that's when it will return to Westminster briefly. Not permanently, but briefly. Because the English had claimed it and said, we're going to use it in our inauguration ceremony. They even created that little niche under, West, under the throne for it. So these pictures date to the 1930s and 1940s before it disappeared then went back, and then of course it's back in Scotland today. So the um, stone. Yep, sorry. The first time I heard of the stone of destiny, can you yeah. say a little bit more about what it was used for? Just that it was, it was a sacred object that the Scottish used in the inauguration of the monarchs. We don't know a lot about where it comes from, as far as where it was maybe made or where it came out of the ground, wherever. It's, it's a lot of mystery behind the stone of destiny. But it was a very important part of. Scottish history, and of course when the English took it, the Scots won it back, and now it's back where it belongs. That's all I can think about. So. Okay. Yes, Mark? Well, we get to see it. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure where it's at. I can just skip all that far. It's the Emperor Castle. Okay, so can, we yeah. should be able to see it. Can we touch it? <laughs> it's probably cordoned off, you know. I don't know. So. It's a great question. It's a great question. Oh, no, that's okay. It's a great question. So 1297 now, approaching the end of the 13th century, the country erupts in open revolt. William Wallace and Andrew de Moray kind of lead the Scottish patriots against the English. De Moray here, or sometimes just Andrew of Moray, was prominent in the Scottish Wars of Independence, and this is what they're referred to. He, read the, he led the rising up in North Scotland in the summer of 1297 against that occupation by the English, Edward I. And he was... Sorry, pages are all stuck. 
and he is accompanied, of course, by William Wallace. The two joined together at Sterling in 1297 to defeat the English at the Battle of Sterling. And this is what kind of puts Wallace on the map. No one knew a lot about William Wallace until the Battle of Sterling. And you will go to Sterling, you will see the castle at Sterling, you will see where the battle takes place, and you will see the Wallace Monument. We'll see pictures of that in just a second. So the stained glass comes from the Wallace Memorial. Um, the statue, I believe, is in Driver in Scotland. Driver? Driver, I'm sorry. I'm part of Scottish I should not pronounce it. You're absolutely right. This is in Aberdeen. So, you know, all across Scotland, we'll find these references to William Wallace. He's that prominent. And of course, you might recognize him. <laughs> Mel Gibson played William Wallace in the 1995 film Braveheart, wanting freedom for his people. Um, the Scots did not paint their face blue. Uh, I found this website, it's like 10 things about the movie that are not correct. But, but before that, when the Romans were coming, they did paint their face blue. Yes, that's that why the Romans were scared of these people. Right. But at this point, they said that they didn't. So there's all kinds of little things in the movie that are not quite right, but yeah, it's, it's Hollywood. It's Hollywood. So you're going to see the one on the, on the left a lot um, because it kind of gives us kind of an overview of some of the major uh, cities in Scotland, places that you're going to go. So I'm going to use that again to show you uh, some of the stuff. But here's Sterling, so on day, I think it is two of your trip, you're going to leave Edinburgh, you're going to stay all night, the first night in Edinburgh, and then, and then leave Edinburgh, and head to Sterling, and then you're going to continue on to Dublin, if I'm not correct. Uh, yes? The thing that says, Sterling's there, you can probably use it for the right of it. Yeah. This is the 
after the place Robert Bruce did Braveheart. It's another statue of Robert Bruce. He's like Walt, he's everywhere. Of course, he does become King Scotland. It's the name. It's like your skipper. So you, you share your skipper. You must say it's kind of like a, if you know someone, a name, like Smith or Jones. There's a lot of boosters, so it's William, you know, Robert Bruce. Yes. I had a joke about Robert Bruce. Um, he walked one of his battles and he was very upset and he escaped and he was hiding in a cave and wondering what he was going to do. And the spider found him in the cave overnight. Well, the spider ran back to the world and he said, well, if the spider can do that in one night, I can do it in four nights. So, You're right. August 5th, 1305, Wallace is captured. He's taken back to London. He's put on trial for treason. He responded to the charge of treason by saying, I could not be a traitor to Edward, for I was never his subject. So that was his word. Nonetheless, he is put on trial in Westminster Hall. There is Westminster Hall. Now, I don't think that's part of your itinerary. Ben will want to you see that. Inside, there's a plaque in the form. It's basically at that spot, basically, roughly, that the trial takes place. He was taken to the Tower of London and detained. He was eventually executed near this spot. The hospital was there. Uh, it's, of course, grown over time. Um, but that um, tablet is in the side of the hospital. Denoting that William Wallace was executed near that site at uh, that point in time. Years later, there was a document that reference to this that kind of revealed what it costs to put Wallace on trial and execute. And it was 61 shillings and 10 pence. Now, you may not understand what that means, but that's about 2150 uh, British pounds. That was the equivalent to about a year's wages for a skilled tradesman in England. So that's what it takes to put Wallace on trial and execute him by the English government. William Wallace is very prominent. The National Portrait Gallery um, at Edinburgh Castle. You see the monument. The monument is not built until 1869. Built basically on that rocky outcrop at the top of the, where the Scots formed out for the Battle of Stirling. And so you can go up that to the monument, you have to go up those stairs. I don't see any handrails. Apparently their trustees didn't it was necessary for the handrails. You should go on arrow. Yeah, you could. That's true. So that's the stairs inside. That brings us to this slide. Now you may be saying, well, what does the Black Death have to do with Scottish history? Good question. What is what we're going to talk about a little bit have to do with Scottish history? I'm laying the groundwork here for what the church is going to have to deal with, the Catholic Church. 1347 is when the Black Death or the Great Plague, whatever you want to call it, bubonic plague, uh, pneumonic plague, it's kind of a blend of several different um, medical problems. First came to Sicily and southern Italy, and then in three years' time, it sweeps northward, including what is today Scotland. We're still not sure how many people succumb to the Black Death across Europe. We estimate it might be a third of Europe's population. That's what I tend to use in class. I tell my students that Europe's population at this point, 1347, was about 75 million people, and the Black Death took 25 million lives. The third. I've seen other estimates that say it's closer to half, 50%. So if 75 million are living in Europe roughly, uh, then we're looking at what, 37, almost 40 million. People didn't know what to do. Families got sick. 
plague spreads, you know, at first they didn't realize where it's coming from. They finally figured out, oh, it's <coughs> coming from rats. Well, it's not really the rats, it's the fleas that are on the rat. The fleas were the ones that were carrying uh, the pestilence. And the fleas would infect the rats, the rats would eventually die, and the fleas would go and look for a new post. And of course, back in the 1340s, people didn't take showers or bathe on a regular basis. They wore the same clothes for weeks and months on end, and the fleas would be on their person. And so just making a handshake, you know, making a they take the sickness home, um, they spread it to their family, the family dies off, the whole village is wiped out. There are villages that are completely decimated because of the plague. But it has a profound impact on the church. The Catholic leaders, the priests, are unsure what to do. They, you know, they get a message that, you know, Merchant Smith down the street is sick. Uh, he's asking for the father to come and, and give him his last rites. And the priest has to make a decision. Well, do I go? Because if I go, I may get the, the plague, and I may get sick and die. And so the Catholic Church has this problem um, because of the plague. You see some woodcuts and some um, drawings of the mass death. The bodies just piled up on the streets. They didn't know what to do with the situation. But it does give the church this black eye because they're not sure what to do about this. This is the Catholic Church we're talking about. And then we can come to this. This is the beginning of what we call the Great Schism in the Catholic Church. Boniface VIII was the Pope sitting in Rome. The French king was Philip IV of France. Philip IV was wanting to tax church lands was one of the things he was asking the papacy uh, to bring. Let him tax church lands in France. And the Pope said, no, nope, you can't do that until I give you my permission. I'm not giving you my permission. There was also some other issues involved in, in terms of putting uh, Catholic priests on trial in France, and the Pope was upset at that. Well, what happens is Pope Boniface VIII is arrested. Philip IV sent troops to Rome and physically arrested the head of the Catholic Church. Pope Boniface was rescued by some Italian nobles who came to his aid, but it, the shock of this is just too much for his system, and he died. He died of the shock. How could a leader of a Catholic nation, France, Philip IV, do this to the head of the Catholic Church. Now this is really not the great schism. The papacy is vacant. Philip IV takes advantage of this. He persuades the French cardinals within the Catholic Church to move the papacy to Avignon in the south of France. Clement V was elected by the French cardinals to be the next pope, and he moves the papacy here to Avignon. And eventually they get around to building the papal um, castle there at Avignon. From 1309 to 1378, the Catholic Church is in Avignon. And actually it's in Avignon beyond that, we'll talk about. 1309 to 1378. So if anybody ever asked you for a trivia question, hey, the Catholic Church has always been in Rome. I'd say, no, I don't think so. It's in Avignon for a while. And I can prove it. Gregory XI. Gregory XI is sitting in Avignon. The year is 1377. He is approached by St. Catherine of Siena from Italy, one of the patron, patron saints of Italy. And she kind of prayed, she said, you know what, you need to do what's right. You need to take the papacy back to Rome, period, back to Rome. And he thinks about it and says, you know what, she's right, you need to take it back to Rome. He takes the papacy back to Rome, he no more gets back to Rome, than he dies of basically old age. People didn't live very long in the 1300s. So, with Gregory gone, the Italian cardinals elected Urban VI to be the next pope, but the French cardinals stepped in and said, you know what, we're going to elect Clement VII. And now begins the great schism.
The church has a serious PR problem of the religion. There's two men claiming to be the Pope. I always say this in class when the students kind of shock like most they think it's a silly joke of the law. But I said, Will the real Pope please stand up? Who's the real Pope? <laughs> the one in Rome or the one in Abigail? Because what's going to happen is Urban's going to stay in Rome, Clement's going to stay in Abigail, go back to Abigail. So what happens is Europe becomes divided. The areas of the I guess you would say red has an allegiance to Abbey down here. They adhere to the popes that are in, and it's not just one, there are several beyond this, beyond these two men. The rest of Europe, in the kind of orange, has an allegiance to Rome. Islam is in control of what becomes Turkey eventually, the Eastern Orthodox Christian faith is over here in the Russian states, in Lithuania, Bulgaria. And there are places like Portugal and over in here in the Austrian Empire where the allegiance has shifted just depending on who was sitting on what throne. Look at Scotland. Scotland adheres and is, an, is allied or has an allegiance to Abraham. Here's a better map. I use this in class a lot. And it really stands out. Scotland, and everything you see in purple, an allegiance to Abigail. So Europe is divided. The church has suffered with the Black Death. The church is now going through this major PR problem. This is what leads to the Reformation. This is the groundwork for the Reformation. The church is really, the church has a problem. Enter Martin Luther. 1570. When the Reformation begins, Martin Luther begins to speak out against the Catholic faith. Now, this is not just some guy off the street. When it was first told to the Pope sitting in Rome, that this German was speaking out against the, that what happens, I, I didn't bring that story to conclusion. The, the great schism eventually ends in 1450. Uh, they bury the hatchet, so to speak. Uh, the papacy is moved back to Rome and it remains there and it's still there today. So end of story, 1450. It's a hundred years later that Martin Luther appears on the scene and begins to speak out against the church. The church was basically giving permission to sell what we call indulgences. In other words, you can buy your way into heaven <laughs> by giving a donation. We just talked about stewardship <laughs> an hour ago. But I don't remember what the point saying, send in your pledge card and you don't get into heaven. <laughs> but an indulgence is the remission of the punishment that you say the guilt of which has already been forgiven. You've been forgiven of your sin. You're just now paying, basically, so you're not punished for your sin. And the church is allowing this to happen. And Martin Luther says, that is wrong. Now, when the Pope got word of that, he said, oh, that's just some drunk German. He'll sober up and he'll realize he made a mistake and he'll come crawling back and ask for forgiveness. But who is Martin Luther? In 1505, he earned a Master of Arts degree from the University of Erfurt in Germany. He then studied law for a period of time. He decided he didn't want to be a lawyer. He decides he's going to become a monk. He enters the monastic school for Augustinian hermits at Erfurt, and he focuses on the assurance of salvation. He studied theology. He earned a PhD in 1512 from the University of Wittenberg. Becomes a lecturer on the Bible. I don't think he's some drunk German. Sounds like he has a pretty solid uh, base. He said the Bible was the chief source of religious truth. Period. Justification by faith and the Bible as the sole authority in religious affairs become the two chief pillars of Lutheranism. The Protestant Reformation. 
Justification by faith, and the Bible is the sole authority in religious affairs. Now he starts out by saying that the Catholic Church allowing for the selling of indulgences was wrong. He never said, I want out. He never said, you know, kick me out of the church, I want to start my own church. He just asked the church to step forward and say, this is right or this is wrong. He didn't care which other way they went. Just make a statement, one way or the other. Well, the Pope, Leo X, kind of has his fill of Martin Luther. He finally kicks him out of the church. He's then summoned to speak to the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V of Spain, the King of Spain. He blew Charles off, and Charles sent out an edict that says basically that Martin Luther was a outlaw of the Holy Roman Empire. So I guess down at the post office, you saw this poster, and one, Martin Luther. October 31st, 1517, he names his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg. His church at Wittenberg, where he preached. He's wanting the church to clarify the selling of indulgences. He has problems with the Catholic Church, and it's off and running the Reformation. The Reformation. Scenes from Wittenberg, the church doors, the churches behind these buildings in the public square here, uh, the statue of Martin Luther. The Protestant Reformation is off and running. Now that's not the same map as we saw a while ago. This deals with the Reformation. The areas in green are areas that are still Catholic in faith. The areas in the yellow are where we find the Lutheran Church, Luther's Church, Lutheranism as we call it, taking off, taking root. Uh, the areas in blue we're going to talk about in just a second, that's where John Calvin and his faith is very prominent. There are areas where it's shaded, and I think Friday Pastor once asked me about that, and I said that is where we find French Calvinists, Huguenots, Protestants within the country of France, a predominantly Catholic country. You can see what's going to happen in England, the rest of the <coughs> jump the channel, and Anglican or the Church of England faith, and of course Scotland will adhere to what John Calvin preaches. We'll see that again in just a minute. How about Calvin? He's not the only, or Luther's not the only one that begins to stir the pot. In Geneva, Switzerland, there's John Calvin. Born in France, makes his way to Switzerland eventually. He is a second generation reformer. Second generation. John Calvin was born in 1509. When did Martin Luther name his 95 Theses? 1517. So John Calvin is eight years old. So you can't say that Calvin and Martin Luther are you know, one and one, or you know, the same generation. They're not. Calvin is a second generation reformer. Calvin preached what we call predestination. Meaning God had decided long before one was born whether that person was going to have it or a tree double hockey sticks. Not believe in the Bible. Something called the cousin. A tree double hockey sticks or heaven. Predestination. He also rejected salvation by works. It didn't matter what you did on earth. Your justification by your faith is enough to gain you salvation. So Luther and Calvin are on the same page. It's just they're a little bit different in time periods. Calvin did differ from Martin Luther, stating that the church, the overall church, should actively intervene in community affairs to ensure the elimination of blasphemy, heresy, and wickedness. To Calvin, the church was a divine institution. It's responsible for administering the sacraments, and the sacraments are baptism and the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. And they were also to preach the word of God. Pretty soon. So with Calvin, it takes off in Switzerland. It moves up into the low countries here, parts of the German states. The red indicates the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire, founded in 800, uh, when the Pope creates that and gives that title to Charlemagne. Henry VIII, of course, picks up the Reformation. Not because of religious reason, he wants a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. And he asked the Pope for an annulment. The Pope said no. Uh, he 
said, well, she won't give me a male heir. And the Pope said, that's not really a good reason for it, no. Just because she can't produce a male heir. And Henry said, you know what? I don't need you anymore. Being in the Catholic Church. He breaks with the Catholic Church. He forms the Anglican Church or the Church of England and grants himself a divorce. I guess you can do that in the Catholic Church. The Anglican Church, the Church of England, uh, continues the Queen of England, who was the second, is still the head of the Anglican Church today. But even before the Church of Scotland even emerges, the Scottish Reformation had begun. Calvinism was brought to Scotland and introduced. The teachings of Martin Luther were brought to Scotland as well. This is Patrick Hamilton, a Lutheran. He brings the teachings of Martin Luther to Scotland in about the early 1500s. And unfortunately, he was born or burned at the stake in 1528 for his beliefs. He becomes one of the first martyrs. Those initials in the payment indicate Patrick Hamilton. That plaque is nearby. Basically, he was tried at St. Andrews. You can see that. You can't see that when you go there. There is St. Andrews. There is the monument. It's not just to Patrick Hamilton. There are other martyrs. Henry Forrest, George Richard, we'll talk about him in a second. Walter Mill. So that sits there at St. Andrews. You'll see another picture of that in just a little bit. Brings us to James V. <coughs> James V, King of Scotland, died in 1542. That left as Peter, the infant, Mary, Queen of Scots, his daughter, as the heir. Now she's just young, too young, really. She was born just months before James died. Now she allows a series of English invasions to happen. And this is known as the rough ruling in Scotland. The English supplied books, distributed Bibles, and Protestant literature in the Lowlands. This is the Church of England. They invaded in 1547. Come back to that. George Wishart, another martyr, Zwingli influenced. George Zwingli in Switzerland was another reformer. I didn't mention him. He's also prominent in Switzerland. Wishart was one of his adherents. He'd fled to Scotland, or sorry, fled Scotland in 1538 to escape punishment for heresy. He first moved to England and took refuge in Germany and Switzerland. He comes back to Scotland in 1544. Unfortunately, that was not a good time to come back. In 1543, James Hamilton, the Duke of I can't pronounce it right, Chateau, Colorado, uh, appointed the regent, was appointed regent for the infant Mary, Queen of Scots, and decided with the Queen Mother, Mary of Guise, and Carvel, Colonel David Beaton to persecute the Protestant sect. So this is going on in Scotland. Wishart's caught up in this. He comes back as a Protestant. And he's caught up in this. Wishart is burned at the stake in 1546. And that's what his name's on that memorial. Some of his supporters include a number of different individuals then assassinate David Beaton. And then they see St. Andrew's Castle. They were defeated with the help of French forces. The French are brought in because they're Catholic. One of those that survived this taking of St. Andrew's Castle was John Knox. John Knox was then condemned to serve as a galley slave. Mary of Guise. This is Mary, Queen of Scots, mother. She served Scotland as regent from 1554 until her death in 1560. She is the main focus of John Knox's uh, bent, I guess you could say, bringing the Scottish Reformation uh, forward. 
So it's not Mary Queen of Scots so much, it's her mother at first. Here's John Knox. There's several books back there about Knox, some of which I brought, some of which passed at once, I'll furnish. Scottish minister, theologian, writer, the leader of the Scottish Reformation, if you will, founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Born sometime around 1505, maybe even as late as 1515, we're not really sure exactly. In or near Haddington, in the, in the county town of East Lothian. His father, William, was a merchant. We don't know a lot about his mother. We know her maiden name was Sinclair. We know that she died early on. He studied possibly at the University of St. Andrews, although we don't know that for sure. He might have studied at the University of Glasgow. He studied under John Major, one of the greatest scholars at that point in time. He becomes a Catholic priest early in his career at Edinburgh on Easter Eve, 1536. So he starts out as a Catholic. He first appears in public records as a priest at a notary in 1540. He was still serving in these capacities as late as 1543. He then became a tutor to a couple of different students. Hugh Douglas and John Cockburn, their sons were tutored by John Knox. We're not sure exactly when he converted to Protestantism, but it perhaps was the key influence. Um, the two key influences were Patrick Hamilton and George Wishart. You know, he knew Wishart. So perhaps Hamilton and Wishart influenced him to the point where he decides to leave the Catholic faith. When David Beaton was murdered in 1546, Knox remained a fugitive for a period of time. He goes back to St. Andrews and becomes a chaplain to the garrison at St. Andrews. So he's serving the, the military garrison there as a chaplain. In 1547, of course, he's taken captive by the French. He works with the, or he, he serves as a galley slave on French warships. He eventually is freed in 1549, makes his way to England for a period of time. He takes refuge in England. He makes his way back to uh, Scotland. He does marry for the first time around uh, 1556, something like that. Uh, his first wife died in 1560. He ends up in France, he ends up in Geneva, of course in Geneva he met John Calvin, studied under Calvin. This is David Tennant, he appeared in the film Mary Queen of Scots, came out in 2018 I believe. Uh, I found that picture past the one half of the talk on projects. He ends up in Germany, uh, there's a letter dated around 1554, he was invited to come to Germany in Frankfurt. There were some English exiles in Frankfurt, and he was invited to preach to them. He goes back to Geneva, then he goes back to Scotland, comes back to Geneva. Supposedly this is the home that he lived in in Edinburgh, although that's been disputed. This plaque stands around where or stood close, and that's supposedly where he did live. He leads a busy life when he was in Geneva. He writes some of his more famous works there. He does come back to Scotland. Preaches at the Church of St. John in Perth. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And that's where he preaches the fiery sermon that kind of starts the Scottish Reformation. In Geneva, this is where he preached the auditorium of the Cowan. 1556, 1558, this is the of Edinburgh. He serves as minister there from 1560 to 1572. It was around 1560 as he went back to Scotland, his first wife died. I found some interesting information online the other day. 1564, he's still preaching. He stirs up a little controversy. He marries a second time. Okay, that's fine. His first wife died. He's a widower of 50. His new second wife was 17. There's a little controversy there. The preacher is marrying somebody at 17 years old. Supposedly, Margaret Stewart, the second wife, was a distant relative to Mary, or Queen Mary Stewart of England. So there is some connection there. They did have three 
three offers together, the second marriage. So that's kind of interesting. I know if I said that in class, my students would go, oh. I talk about Henry VIII and all his wives and what happened. They're like, oh, I can't believe that. St. John's, you see that. There's the interior. You got a fantastic hole in there. And it doesn't have chairs, and no pews. I don't think we need chairs. There is preaching uh, a funeral sermon of the Regent Moray, no relation to the other Moray. <coughs> That's in one of the windows of the church there at St. John's. Statues inside the High Kirk in Edinburgh, John Knox at Geneva, the Reformation Wall. Here's the University of Edinburgh. Some of his more famous works. Uh, I didn't print this off for everybody. I can get you a copy of the slide if you're interested. Uh, the last one there, the history of the Reformation in Scotland, is a two volume work that's back there on the day. And now, your trip. You're going to leave Edinburgh. Scott, did you mind if we just think about that? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. Just to think, as, as we talk around um, the highlands of Scotland, it is not chronological. It's just no. geographically clockwise. So, so Scott's going to now weave in those, those chronological yeah. pieces of history. And there's another two. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you're not going to, I don't know how many people are going or not. So those that are not going on the trip, you'll benefit from this because you're going to kind of see what they're going to see when they go next next spring. Uh, so you're going to stay in Edinburgh uh, the first night that you're there. You'll fly into Edinburgh, I guess, and stay there. And then on that first actual day, they go out the second day of your trip. You're going to head to Stirling. That's where you're going to see the Stirling Castle, the battle site, uh, William Wallace Monument. You're going to see all that stuff. There's the, the town of Stirling that you're going to see. And then you're eventually uh, going to be passing through the Loch Lomond region as you travel from Stirling to Oban. You're going to go this direction, you're going to keep going this direction. Continuing on that first full day out uh, from Edinburgh, the Loch Lomond uh, region. You're eventually going to get to Oban. That's your final destination, so there it is along the waterfront. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that structure at the top of the hill there in just a second. It's just a folly. A folly? Yeah, yeah. It's called McCraig's Tower. Uh, prominent there. Uh, McCraig, uh, well, he wanted to build this lasting monument to his family. Uh, and he provided the local stonemasons with work during the winter months as well. He was an admirer of Greek and Roman architecture. He planned this elaborate structure there, built like the Colosseum in Rome. And so they eventually built this. Uh, probably between 1897 and when he died in 1902. So it's not really that old. So it doesn't go back to the days of William Wallace and those. But it figures probably there when you look up from the waterfront. Or if you're up there looking down on the, on the community, you can go inside and walk around it. It serves no purpose as far as a defense uh, fortification. You just build it as a memorial to this kind of Found that picture. That was kind of nice picture. Looking up from the streets as well. So it creates power. And again, you're going to go from Obama out to Iona. You're going to see that Iona Abbey at this point in time. Eventually, you're going to leave Oban or Oban. Day four, and you're going to head northward towards this direction. You're going to pass through Glen Cove. You're going to see the site. Neptune Staircase, this is the Caledonia Canal, built to bring the water down and move the ships up and down the canals. Fort William, you're going to pass Fort William. There's a map of Fort William back there, also a map of Vaughan that Pastor Lawrence provided. You're going to go through that region, so you're leaving Vaughan, which is down. It's 
tough, like right there, right in here, I think. Because there's where Iowa is, right? And so you're going to go in this direction on that one day. Past Lock Ness, you're going to do the Great Glen. Lock Ness, I mean, maybe you'll see Ness in that one. Walk past there. Parker Castle. Yeah. And then, of course, you're going to come to the Culloden Battlefield. This is much later in time. This is 1745 46. The Jacobites rose up. Uh, if you know any history about the history of the English Civil War, and I brought. I had a nice little thing I printed out here. You won't try to find her I want to find Yeah, right. So, you know, we started, we talked about Henry VIII, and then, of course, you know, Edward VI, Mary, Bloody Mary, and then Elizabeth. Elizabeth died in 1603, the last of the Tudor dynasty. Then the Stuarts are brought in. And the Stuarts, of course, start with James IV, they're coming from Scotland. James V, Mary, Queen of Scots. James VI, he's also James I of England. So it's James VI of Scotland and James I of England. Don't think it can be confusing there, but that's it. But that's the House of Stuart. Charles, of course, was executed. The English Civil War erupts. The Commonwealth is proclaimed. Oliver Cromwell and Richard Cromwell are introduced. And then the Stuart dynasty comes back with Charles II and then James II. It's at that point in time, right after that, the Glorious Revolution, and then George I is brought in, the House of Hanover. George the first, George the second, and of course George the third. Anybody know who George the third is? King of England when America declares independence. So with the House of Hanover, the House of Stuart ceases to exist. However, there was a movement to bring the Stuarts back after that glorious revolution with William and Mary. And so the Jacobites were the ones pushing for this bringing the House of Stuart back, not only to the throne of Scotland, but to the throne of England and Ireland. And so you're going to see the Culloden Battlefield, Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites. This is where they rose up and had one of the major battles against the English armies, the Hanoverian king, George I, and his armies. You're going to see that battlefield as you head northward. As you see from that famous uh, upright. You're going to end up in Nar. Is that what you're to say? Nar. That's where you're ending on day four. Here's the coastline near Nar. There's the community itself. And then you're going to go out to our visit plus garden at the right place uh, first. That's not on a normal itinerary on the Scottish tours. Past Lawrence. Sure. Well, has a job. I'll let him take the stage at this point. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's interesting that in the so the Church of Scotland is continuing to change, and we're seeing some of that. The, the, those numbers at the beginning of the slideshow. Um, in the early 20th century, um, as Iona Abbey is restored as an ecumenical worship center for the Church of Scotland, it had been disused for hundreds of years. Plus Garden Abbey is restored as a Roman Catholic monastery as well. So you, in, in the 20th century, you have this restoration of some of the, the buildings and institutions that had been um, abandoned for hundreds of years. So Plus Garden Abbey is a Benedictine monastery today, and um, th this has a very personal tie into my call story. I studied in Aberdeen, University of Aberdeen, um, in college, and one weekend the Church of Scotland pastor ministered in Jillian took a group of probably 14 of us or so students from Aberdeen out to Plus Garden Abbey where we were having a weekend. A retreat, we went to, we went to the, the the different monastic prayer services. And it was there that I really felt a call to the ministry, um, even though I still wanted to be a scientist. Um, I remember bargaining in my journal uh, in, in that chapel. And because it's so close to Plus Garden Abbey, and on the way to the Cairngorm Mountains, which will come next, uh, Jim Wallace said, yeah, we'll stop there. And so um, he's adding that as a stop of what, so we're seeing Iona Abbey as a living, breathing, ecumenical religious community in the west of Scotland and in the highlands, I mean in the islands, and then the east of Scotland here, um, this is kind of, yeah, sort of on the edge of the highlands, 
we're going to be in another living, breathing Roman Catholic community uh, monks. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, in brief, that's the story of Plus Hardman. Okay. So. so you're going to see that. There's kind of a, I don't know, how many pages you want. It's from Roman yeah. Catholic. You're going to go down through the Cairn Warm Mountains. I don't know if you're going to get to go on this. It's on the itinerary. But I read online where uh, the piers have some serious uh, problems and they've shut it down. And now they're debating are they going to tear it down? Are they going to repair it? What are they going to do? How much is it going to cost the, the country of Scotland to take care of it? He just basically takes you up into the ski resort area um, there. The mountains. But anyway, it's kind of interesting. Put it on there just in case both of these things. Right. We're going to end up down um, towards Perth, eventually arriving in Perth, and that's where you're going to see, of course, um, St. John's Kirk in Perth, where John Knox preached that sermon in 15, 1559. That kind of starts the Scottish Reformation. And then you go inside. See that structure. That's the War Memorial um, the <coughs> church. It's kind of like our War Memorial window. And then from Perth, you're going to go out to St. Andrews. This is St. Andrews, of course, to the university, the golf course. And there's that monument. Remember the Martyrs Monument? There it is. I didn't know it was there until the other day. I didn't look at the slide. Oh, actually, on this screen, Friday. Here in this space, we watched the Chariots of Fire movie. So uh, they actually used this scene. It was filmed in St. Andrews, though. The story is set in the south of England. But this is the scene that they used. So, so they're running across the golf course, and they jump the fence as the as, as, as Chariots of Fire movies. It was freezing out there filming this thing. You're going to head back to for Dundee and or back to Edinburgh, Dundee, and Perth. And you're gonna spend the last what a couple days in Edinburgh seeing the sights, going to Great Friars Kirk. Okay. And of course that's where the National Covenant was signed in 1638, officially forming the Church of Scotland. Which is also this is where Great Friars Bobby. The story that we saw about the very first one takes place in that church courtyard. And I found the Scottish gave me the words for the. Yeah. <laughs> 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 